today. And it's still the true church, because you're all way back there. <laughs> so, away from the microphone. <laughs> so in our little chat group that we're having here today, how did your homework go? There were three things. The Lord's Standard of Morality by uh, Tad Collister. Uh, go to the church website, Overcoming Pornography, and look at those five home evening lessons. Think about which one you might want to do in your home, or maybe you did one, but you know, look at those topics. And uh, the <coughs> talk by Richard and uh, Linda Iyer that she posted, the article by them, uh, I think there were eight. So they have a new eight. one now, too. They have a new, another new one? Good. They, they, they put out some good stuff. So did you do, did you have time to do any of that, or what did, what did you think? What, which one did you do, and which one did, and how did it go? Or do you want to share? Would you? Well, I did. I did all of them. I read both of the talks by um, Linda and Richard Iyer. Uh huh. And um, I, I, yeah, I did. I did all of them. I um, wanted to do my my six year old on the Saturday asked if she could do family home meeting because she was looking through one of the friends and she found an article that she wanted to do. And, um, so, you know, on, on the way home I said, you know, is there, can I fit something into yours that I'd like to do? And then we got home and Satan took over. And, um, <laughs> like, seriously, he did everything that he could to make it so that we would not have so we didn't do, I was going to show him the little video that mm -hmm. was on there, and I just, I, it was not the right time. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it funny when you're really going to do something important, really meaningful, it's such a fight because Satan's there, doesn't want you to do it. Exactly. Which should create your testimony that what you're trying to do is even more important than you think it is. Yeah, when he wants to stop you that bad, my money's on you though. You'll get her done. And you were smart. You were smart to recognize then that that wasn't the right time. Because those things, timing's important. And so I'm, I'm really proud of you for backing off. You know, so I'm glad you came today. We'll talk about discouragement and distress and adversity. And so, yeah, but you were smart. That was a good choice. That was a really good choice. Anyone else? Yeah. And say, I like Linda and um, Richard Iyer's thing, because those are things that we actually do in our house. But my twins each have a tablet that has how much time they're allowed on it a day, and then it shuts itself off. Yes! And the only way they can get the password from mom is if they do their homework and they do their chores, so they don't get it every day. But it's about a 30-minute window, and then there's 30 minutes where I have they can read books that I've downloaded, and then it shuts that off too. So that, and there's no back door for them to go and try and play games. And um, so I love the fact that you know they can still have that technology. Mm -hmm. We don't do video games and things at our house like that. But I like that they can play those educational, you know, games that I've downloaded. But they yeah. know that the rule is it does not go in their bedroom. They have to be on the couch or at the kitchen table or. Um, you know, something like that, and my boys know that when we have dinner, all the phones are in the living room, and they're on vibrate, and I don't care if they go off, because even mine, if it goes off, I'm like, sorry, we're eating dinner. And Good I'm job. Like, Good job. We've been doing that for a long time, and then my husband and I both dock our phones and our tablets at the same time our boys do at night, just to kind of show them we're not being mean. Dad yeah. and ironing, playing games, or, you know, doing whatever when we're asking you to do it as well. So I think when you, when you show your kids that you're as serious about doing the same things, they take it a little more seriously because they don't bat an eye anymore. That oh, absolutely. It's 9.30, turn your phones in. Yeah, wow. absolutely, absolutely. It takes the hypocrisy out of it. So yes, wonderful. And if you start this when they're young, the flack that you're gonna get when they're older just decreases. Well, and that's why we started with our little ones, because the flack we got from our two oldest were, they're like, well, 
what the problem is. Yes. And we ended up do, did having trouble with one of, with my stepdaughter where um, she ended up in some pretty bad trouble because of stuff that she was doing at her mom's house and then tried to come do it at our house yeah. and I caught her and um, she ended up with her phone taken away and getting into some pretty big trouble that the rest of our kids are like, okay, we don't want to do that. So Good. Um, but something else, if, if you're on Facebook at all, there's an SRO that works, I think he's at Mountain View, he used to be at Rocky Mountain, but his name's David Gomez and he is, most of what he's been posting lately is totally about technology and don't give your kids a smartphone if they're under 14 and make sure you have these things because he sees the consequences of yes. what happens if yeah. parents aren't paying attention. Well, and parents aren't there to, to know. Yeah. So, and tells you not to have your kids use Snapchat. And there's, I mean, there's a list of them that I'm like, I've never even heard of half of these. And they ask my boys and they're like, well, we've heard of them, but my oldest has... I don't know, like a ten-year-old iPhone, and he's like, "Mom, I can't even download games." Yes. You know? <laughs> I'm like, okay, there's a stop for his dad. You know, he's like, I have, I have Facebook, and I have Instagram, and he's like, I, I can't download anything else. My phone's too old. But I know my stepson probably can. But you know, I just have to monitor what I can. Yeah. So, yeah. And and that's that. That was a wise comment you just made. In a divorce situation where they're there half the time and they're with you half the time, you can monitor what you can. Yep. You don't get to, they don't get to tell you what to do in your home and you don't get to tell them what to do, you know, in their home. And it, it creates lots of problems. Divorce just creates lots of problems. Oh, that's an understatement. But, <laughs> but you have to, rather than be so focused on what you can't do, be focused on what you can do. And they will come to a place where even though they have more freedom or whatever in, in the other home, they will feel more secure and they will feel the spirit. And that will bring them to want to choose that. You talk about having choices and seeing the choices, you know, then that becomes very, very apparent in a lot of divorce situations. Sad, sad, sad. But we can have some really strong, wonderful youth come out of those experiences because they experience both sides and then make the choice yep. to, you know, follow the spirit. So, and this is Tanner one and one. <laughs> you know, I, I try to tell you when it's gospel and when it's me. I really believe that because in divorce situations, the children are innocent that the Lord, if the children will allow, will pour out an extra amount of spirit. You know, I just think he sends his angels to protect them if they'll allow it. Mm -hmm. They have to allow it, but I think he's so mindful, so mindful of their innocence and, and where they are. Anyone else? Re yeah. So I didn't, um, I kept trying to get to the homework, but um, I, I did one of those things where a thought comes to your mind, you know, and so you write it down in class last week. Good job! I know, and so I focused on that. I tried to get to the homework, but I never did make it work. But um, 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 I just had the impression that our family should work on memorizing the family proclamations. Oh. And so that is, now we've almost got the first paragraph done, and that's kind of been what our focus is. And um, so we're just going <coughs> to, we're ticking through on that, but we kind of had that. That wasn't my plan for our memorizing pattern to go. We, I, it wasn't on the docket. I'm like, I don't want to memorize another one. <laughs> another one. <long thing. laughs> it took us so long. But you did living the Christ. living Christ. Yeah. Did yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that took so long, but I really, um, so they had each memorized, we started memorizing scriptures, just the scriptures, and they'd each done one, and then last class, I'm like, I really think we should start memorizing the family proclamation, and, um, my kids have never said anything about it, and we were bringing something down the stairs, and my husband hit, we have a proclamation on the stairwell as you go up, and it turns, 
and my husband hit it, and my nine-year-old was like, Dad, you hit the proclamation! <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so funny, because we had been working on memorizing it, you know, for a few days by then, and it's already starting to mean something to them. Yeah. It's just the first sentence. So how do you do it? What, what, what does that look like? How do you create that in your family? So we do, um, in the morning, they're, uh, they have to leave out the door at like 7.30. And they're usually ready by 7.30. And so, and we've really gotten into the habit of morning prayer. And um, just when we started doing the Living Christ last year, I'm like, because we don't have time to do um, a scripture study in the morning because I refuse. We do it at night. <laughs> like I refuse to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning or whatever. But so we just started working on a sentence. And so we just, just sit there. We're like, hey, let's go over it. So now we're like, we, the First Presidency, and the Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, over and over and over. And that's only a third of the first sentence. Yeah. And we just, over and over, we just go through and we say it like five times. And I'm like, okay, say it together. And we just say it five times or so. Yeah. Sometimes we do it more. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, you say it now. We the first presidency, you know, and then they get stuck, and so we look at it, and so and we Good go job. over and over, and then we just tack on. Yeah, the next three to five more words. Yeah, once we've got that locked in, and so yeah, that's awesome. And we just do it every morning because they have to be ready for school and have breakfast, and <laughs> yeah, we have prayer before they leave, and so we just do it before we do prayer. Oh, I think so that's we have awesome. Prayer and then they go. Yeah, that that's great. I you know and. Everybody has a different way, you know, the practice, the way. Uh, Memorizing is hard for me, really hard. And so that's, I would have to do it repetitively, repetitively. I, had a, I was at my son's house and my daughter-in-law had a heavy plastic uh, table covering, clear plastic table covering over her table. And at each place, she has nine children but at each place was a proclamation underneath the plastic so that as you sat down at the table, no matter where you were, to eat breakfast, there it was, or lunch, or dinner, it was always there. And they would just repeat, you know, read aloud. They read it aloud, the whole thing, every day, but... It gets kind of long. It gets with, with long. With the Living Christ, we did chunks. Yeah. I had little papers and I taped them to the where they sat, sit at the bar stool and eat snacks. See, so perfect. We take them, I take them in the bathroom. We have all the little pieces of paper in the bathroom. Hey, that's <laughs> awesome. The so they can review the, the living Christ. Yeah. <laughs> but we have it in all of our bedrooms. So now I've just got to do that with the family proclamation. I guess such a great there. idea. It's just present. It's, every, it's in every room in our house, the living Christ is, because we've oh. been working on it. That's <laughs> what you call a Christ-centered home. <laughs> well, we try. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. There was another comment. Somebody had another comment? Yes. Well, I had a comment. Just, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure if you guys are talking about this, or, but about the, like, devices and yeah. that. Yeah. That we kind of covered this last week. Uh -huh. So we implemented a ton of new rules this week. And a I guideline? Uh -huh. goes, and he said, he said this before, he says, every time you go to that parent come home with a lot of big changes. <laughs> but did you learn this at this parenting class? And I was like, it doesn't matter. Whereas he always was like, that's what you got. <laughs> it always was but um, the one thing, and it's a total given, and I think Eric and I um, pretty much have known this, but it's been really neat to see it pay off because um, we were parents that would let our kids, they all had an iPad, but my daughter had a phone and they would only get 15 minutes, but they used it to wind down. So they could read on it or else um, watch like a cute little series. Uh, and we made sure what they were doing, mm -hmm. but they could lay in bed with it to kind of wind down. And um, yeah, we, we changed that to no, no devices in your bedroom. And uh, my daughter's like, do you not trust us anymore then? Do you just not trust us? And that, I wasn't quite prepared for that one. I'm like, no, it has nothing to do with trust. It's just as parents, you know, we're, we're setting this guideline to keep you guys safe. And, um, you know, we kind of explained it that, that way. That was a good answer. Yeah. And I just say, you know, we all will mess up and, you know, bump into things that we shouldn't see on the Internet. And we just would rather you not have it in your bedroom. And, um, so 
So the first two nights, we gave them these little lanterns, reading lanterns, to make them have a book. How cute! They book, so they got the, their own colored lantern, and so they were reading, but I kid you not, the minute they were, you know, we're like 15 minutes to reading, they turned out all full. And my kids have been dealing with sleep issues for a while, and we thought, oh, maybe it's stress, it's anxiety, it's different things, but it was, I mean, obviously. Technology. The technology. It's the screens. And yesterday, Ava goes, is there any way I can earn back my phone at night? And I go, uh-uh. No, nope, that rule's just, it's there to stay. And Gavin goes, you know, Ava, I think it's getting way better. He goes, I like it a lot better, and I'm grateful. But he was the one the very first night, he's like, so did you learn this at this parenting class? <laughs> but um, I did, I, to hear him say that after a week of implementing that, and Ava still, she really likes having that phone. But she, isn't she older? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it has a lot to do with age. Age, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and so, um, yeah, but it's been, it's been exciting. It's been exciting, and I'm glad that my son already sees that Things are going better because I sleep a lot better, and I think it's a lot better, Ava. I heard him say that to his sister, and Ava's like, "Yeah, yeah. I but can't, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've met somebody in a grocery store, and they've had their kids with them, and they'll say, oh, and you know, this is Sister Tanner who teaches the parenting class, and you see the kids go, like, I don't like you. <laughs> it's okay with me, though. I really don't care. No, I don't." Think it's so not a popularity contest. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. But you will always see, I think when you change rules, there will be immediately rebellion and then hang tough. Don't give in. In, in kindness and in love, hang tough. And then you will start seeing the benefits. Because they, they uh, on the moment, are going to push to make it go back the same way. So you, the bad behavior, if you will, escalates as they argue with you and they push on you to make it happen. But if they see that you're going to be, you're not giving in, yeah. then it comes back down and then they start realizing that there's some benefits there. And yesterday my daughter did say, um, so she still is kind of pushing that. And she's such a good girl. She really is. And she has, she never has gotten in trouble and we do watch what they look at and she's very, responsible that way and she just said last night she just said I've never done anything mom I've never looked at anything or done anything so I don't understand why you just won't let me lie down with it at night it's like my time mm -hmm. and so she still is really trying to and I did catch myself going it's true she's never really done. don't but do I, it I just don't do it that. but yeah she's not she's not as going with the flow quite as much I think she's going to keep how old her. is she she's almost 13 yeah it's and age. It's an age an thing. Older soul. Yeah. 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 It's age, and all my friends get to, and why can't I? And I've never done anything wrong. And, but you have to continue to help them know that your responsibility is to protect them. And this is one of the ways that you do. We, our kids used to, I don't, you, you just don't trust me. Yeah. And so what we tell them is we trust you, we don't trust what's out there. And so we're just taking that out of the equation. So that's what we tend to use with them. That's good. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I was going to say, we um, won't give our kids the Wi-Fi password. And my 17-year-old fights me on this all the time. And I'm like, I'm sorry. There is a computer downstairs where there is internet access for where I can see you on it. And I can't always see what's on your phone. And so I think you know, they get that, well, my friends don't. Well, <laughs> they don't realize that we as moms talk. <laughs> and a couple weeks ago, I was, I guess it was Sunday, I was talking to one of my friends, and um, she said, well, you know, my kids come home all the time and say, well, the Coltons aren't allowed to do this, the Coltons aren't allowed to do this, and I look at them and go, neither are you. Oh. And so I was able to go to my kids and say, <laughs> really? Because I talked to this mom and this mom, and I said, my son, one of my sons has a friend whose parents are by far way stricter than we are. And I'm like, Tristan's not allowed to do that. And he's like, I know, but he's the only friend. I'm like, no, 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 no. Try again. I said, none of this stuff is going to sway your dad and I from changing our minds about what the rules are at home. Well, how come you and dad can 
you have the Wi-Fi password. And I'm like, good grief, we pay for it. You know, if you would like to pay my internet bill every month, by all means, go for it. And then that usually, you know, shuts them down. Yeah. But, you know, just from being a teacher, and I haven't been in the classroom in, it must be 12 or 27, so six years. And I've been, you know, going back and working in the schools, and I'm amazed at what little first graders and little fifth graders, and, you know, fifth graders aren't really all that little, but compared to some of my kids, they are what they're talking about and the things that they can see and the things that they're just like, holy cow, my almost 20 year old was not like this when she was in fifth grade and just, you know, oh yeah, just the difference in 10 years. What, what but a lot of it's on TV yeah. too. Just what but, parents yeah, are what watching on TV that they see they on TV. Home. Yeah. Yeah. It's just scary. Yeah. The new stuff on TV is just pornography as far as I'm concerned. But I have to say too, I, I took from the class last week and I went home and I told my kids last night, I'm like, there are a couple TV shows mom's not going to watch anymore. Because as I sat and kind of thought about it, I'm like, okay, that one's not teaching my kids, you know, that this is, this is good and this is good. And I'm like, so why, why would I as a parent watch that when I'm telling my kids don't do that? And so yeah. my husband's like, you're seriously giving up that show? And I'm like, yep. He's like, holy cow, never thought I'd see that day. And I haven't watched it since, um, you know, I came last week. And he's like, okay, we're one week down. Are you going to keep going? I'm like, yeah, I told my kids. And sometimes I think if we're accountable to our kids, it's it's easier to do something and to stick with it or just accountable to anybody. And yeah. They tell you when you're trying to lose weight, have somebody that you're accountable to rather than trying to do it yourself. And so I think if we can show our kids that, they get to help hold us accountable and vice versa. I think it works better. Yeah. Oh, I think there's a whole lot of stuff on TV that if you would look at it with the eye of what is this teaching and what is it representing and what are they learning rather than just following the story and, you know, following it as you would have, that, oh, we might be shocked at what's... Oh, I was, yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Interesting. I'm proud of you. Good girl. That's awesome. Be, and it's also a fabulous role model to show them. That's bearing your testimony. That I believe these things aren't good, therefore I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing. Like you were talking about food. It's one thing for me to say, I believe that chocolate's really not good for you, but could you bring me another pound of seeds? I would really, you know. So to live it says, I believe it. So now it's not a pound. If you just bring me a quarter pound, I'll be happy. <laughs> I'm improving. Percentages. I'm not getting it out. I'm afraid my hormones would go out of balance. I gotta have my fix. <laughs> Anyone else wanna share? What they've discovered, thought, impressions they had may not even been in the lesson that you came across or that you figured. If there's no more, no brave souls that want to share, we'll go forward. We'll go on. You realize this is our last class for this semester. So uh, then it's practice. Practice over the summer. It's just your chance to practice all these wonderful, fun things. Uh, we'll start back up again the second week in September. Uh, and we'll... I'm sure we'll just do it, uh, one class will be right here. I don't know what other ones I'll be teaching, but this seems to be the home base class. So we'll, we'll go from here and hopefully we can bring in a few more that, uh, that wanna you know, be here with us because it makes a difference. In, I think it really helps to be able to share with a lot of people and get a lot of different insights in you know, what's going on in other homes. You don't feel so bad that yours is, you know, th there's no perfect homes out there. There, there aren't. We're just all working in that direction. So today, we're going to talk about stress and adversity. There's a difference between the two. Adversity can cause stress, but stress isn't always connected to adversity. Does that make sense? So what are things that are stressful, and what are things to you that are adversity? So what's stressful? What, what creates stress? Maybe we don't need this lesson. 
What creates stress? I think when you have a lot of things on your plate. Busyness? Um, so much one thing right after the other thing that, that you get stressed mm -hmm. with, with having such a large amount of things. And the more kids you have, the more that stacks up. The busyness. Yeah. I know my husband gets a lot of stress from just deadlines, things that are, yeah, I mean, a lot on his plate, but just, yeah. So do you get stressed? Well, do you get yeah. stressed? Yes, but I, um, I'm always stressed. So, yeah. So what causes stress? I think as mother, and I'm trying to turn about this, is because we're carrying not just our own burdens, but the children's and our spouse's. Okay. My kids come home and tell me about, you know, which that's what we want. We want them to lay those things on us so we can, can help them with those things. But as a mother, my stress comes from not just my own responsibilities and things on my plate, but just carrying, yeah, I guess just the burdens and everything for you, not just you, but your family too. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, in our family, it's money and medical bills because we have a couple little ones that have some special needs and they're expensive. Yeah. And, oh, you know, yeah. And so that, that is kind of our constant source of stress. And having, I think, teenagers is another constant source of stress. <laughs> and um, I just think trying to find a balance sometimes because I, I haven't worked in a lot of years and now I'm working part-time and trying to balance the house and <laughs> the kids and I'm lucky in the fact that my kids don't play a lot of sports. I teach my little ones music lessons but we don't have a whole lot of running mm -hmm. um, but it's just sometimes constantly my calendar just looks like it you know how crazy I'm supposed to get this one here and this one here and this one here and um, I think it's just trying to find a balance in life and Satan likes to just throw kinks in your life and I think sometimes particularly moms um, we're the ones that are supposed to kind of set the tone in our home mm -hmm. and when mom's stressed everybody else seems to be stressed you bet absolutely I think it also comes from just worrying about um, you know the, the future the unknown what's coming up um, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of emotions that there is because you, know, you think about when tragedy or chaos something erupts you, you can totally hone in and focus and take care of the situation but worrying about all the possibilities of things that could happen just in life in general is just it's, it can be really overwhelming if you let your brain go there isn't that interesting it's true that we want to problem solve maybes you know, if that happened, then what would we do? If this happened, then what would we do? If this happened, what would we do? But the truth is, the spirit doesn't give you the answers until you're in the problem. So the problem solving pre doesn't work, but we have to have the faith that in the moment, the spirit will guide us through it. And it will, regardless of what it is. It will. If we choose that avenue. We choose to open the door and let the spirit in. Okay, so we've done busyness, teenagers, money, or the lack thereof, medical. Uh, life changes. Yeah. Changes in life. Absolutely. Maybe you notice your parents when you get older, you've got the stress of your aging parents take the cycle where now you're taking care of them. Versus them taking care of you, absolutely, absolutely. These things definitely create stress. Yes. I think health and what you were saying with medical issues, and I think also, you know, as our marriage, just marriage and intimacy and the closeness in marriage, sometimes it can be more stressful at times. Like oh yes, it. it's not constant. Right. Any it's relationship right. has, has the ups and downs, uh -huh. and marriage where we. Right. Think that a good marriage should always be wonderful, right. and then it hits a curve that we're going. Babies, <gasps> hormone changes. Yes, or, I mean the intimacy factor can definitely there can be stress that. 
oh, sometimes you yearn for the intimacy and sometimes you say, do not touch me. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and that does. That creates hormones in women. Now we're getting into some real issues with women. You know, the, the hormonal part, it's real. It's very, very, very real. And sometimes you, you want to be happy, but it's like living outside of yourself and watching this really crabby person go through life and you're going, that's, that's just not me, I'm, I'm a good person, that's a weird person. <laughs> so, you know, we like to almost take ourselves out of ourselves sometimes, hormonally, absolutely. Okay, I want you to write on your paper three of those main things that are causing you stress right now. Besides memorizing the proclamation. <laughs> I love your attitude. Love it, love it, love it. I'm really surprised that some of you did not say um, being more righteous causes you stress. That you feel like you need to be better. <laughs> You're all you all have it made. You're all there. You recognize that you can't be perfect, so be happy with where you're at. We're all trying. We're here. We're all trying. That's right. That's right. That's right. You got it? Okay, so now as we go through today, the questions I want you to kind of think about in the back of your mind are. Um, which ones of these do I have control over and which ones of these do I not have control over? So, divorce. Do you have control over the fact that somebody left you? No, that's something you don't have control over. So some things you do have control over, some things you don't have control over. You may not control what your income is right now, that's something you can't control. I mean, if that's what his job is and that's what he's making, but you can control how you use it, or you can control maybe thinking about ways to add to that income, but other than getting a different job, you know, some things are. Now you can choose together maybe to change occupations. That's something you can choose, but in the moment, you may not have control over it right, right now. Um, say, say your spouse or your child is addicted to something. Do you have control over that? Do you control that? No. So what's in your realm of possibilities is how do you influence that? How do you help them? How do you reach out to them? That's your area of control. But so often we get stressed because our focus is wrong. We feel like my responsibility is to change you and they have to change them. Your area of control is what do I do to help them gain that strength or encourage them or give them that hope that they might want to choose that. So the first thing in managing stress is to figure out what things that you have control over. Uh, weight gain, if you don't like how your body looks, then you have control over what you'll do about it. And maybe you're pretty weak there. Maybe that's a, a real weakness. So your control might be, I'm just gonna start by drinking more water every day. You know, to take the baby steps required. It isn't going to be, okay, in three months, I'm gonna weigh 50 pounds less, and then you beat yourself up every morning when you get up because at night, last night you had ice cream. Do you know what I say? So, so you're going to set incremental steps. As, uh, we'll talk about that as, as managing the stress. Uh, a super busy life, that's what stresses you. You can't sell a child to simplify it. <laughs> but there are things that you can do to help reduce that. It's interesting that Heavenly Father, in his mercy, and Satan, in his craftiness, takes the same principle and 
the Lord blesses us with it and Satan will curse us with it. For example, uh, all of you know more than you live. Uh, our, our testimonies and our life is like a train going down railroad tracks. And you know, they have the big light at night in front of the, the train. And so as the train moves down the railroad tracks, that big beam, that big headlight, lightens the track in front of the train. And it goes down the track and can see where it's going. Well, it's just the same. And as, as the train goes down the track, the light moves forward. So the light never stops at the front of the train. It consistently is out ahead of the train. So as you gain testimony of various principles of the gospel, so you're receiving more light and knowledge, your ability to live everything that you know is like the train. You are actually getting better. You're moving down the track. But as you do, the Holy Ghost teaches you more light and knowledge. So your light of light and, of light and knowledge is always in front of where you are. Because the Holy Ghost will continue to teach you more so that you can keep moving forward. So you, you always have a direction of where to move. So if you evaluate yourself according to what you know, you, you never win. Because the Holy Ghost by nature will teach you more. Because you make yourself qualified for more. And you receive more light and knowledge. So that's not a good criteria. It's the criteria should be that we need to be working on how to improve the things that we know. But then it's very interesting that we'll, we'll learn more or we'll get a deeper understanding and our light and knowledge will move forward. So that's not a, if we're headed in the right direction, if our train's moving in the right direction and we're moving, that's good. That's good. Uh, the prophets have said, just be on the train and be moving in the right direction. And it doesn't matter how fast or slow, just be moving. So we need to be constantly focused on improving and getting better. But don't evaluate, but I know better, I know better, I know I shouldn't. I... Don't go there. Just work on moving forward incrementally. And that's and that is good enough. And that will take us to the celestial kingdom. If we're daily trying to keep our covenants and do the things that, that we know in, the ste in small steps, but we're moving, then that's adequate. That's good. That's what the Savior wants us to do. However, Satan is so, so smart. Um, this is from a talk from uh, Elder Hales, Robert E. Hales. And I really want you to pay attention to this because it is really a ha kind of a, a quote. For, it was for me. We must remember that the adversary knows us extremely well. He knows where, when, and how to tempt us individually. So what may be a temptation to you may not be a temptation to me but he knows where my buttons are and he will push my buttons. If we are obedient to the promptings of the Holy Ghost, we can learn to recognize the adversary's enticements. Before we yield to temptation, we must learn to say with unflinching resolve, get thee behind me, Satan. Now there's two parts of this. Did you catch what they were? Number one, if we are obedient to the promptings of the Holy Ghost, that's an if. It's an if and then promise. So if you receive promptings of the Holy Ghost and you're obedient, then you receive the gift of discernment. And the gift of discernment is the ability to see between right and wrong. And it's not always black and white. Sometimes your kids will ask something or you will want to do something. You know, watching a, being watched a TV 
tempted to watch a movie that's inappropriate. You, you know, you will, you will, re Satan will try to take you there. Anything he can do to desensitize you from the spirit. But that gift of discernment is just that prompt that says, this is not good for you. And the quicker we learn to follow the Holy Ghost and say, get thee hence, Satan. I know it's from you. See, Satan is so subtle that when we make wrong choices or we make choices that are less than make us feel good about ourselves, we say, oh, I'm, I, I'm a bad person. I, oh, I didn't do that. I'm just, uh. and we take it personally as we're weak rather than saying, that was Satan tempting me. We recognize Heavenly Father and the promise of the Holy Ghost, but we don't always. We think that we're flawed if Satan, if we, if Satan tempts us. So we need to understand there are two opposing forces working, and we have the choice of which one to follow. Our worth is not changed if we sin. Our value as a person, we are still of great worth to Heavenly Father. We're not as worthy to stand before him when we sin and we need to repent and become clean. But our worth remains the same. And Satan wants to tempt us to think that we are not worthy. And that's not true. That's not true. Sister um, Joy Jones taught in the last conference it was about that principle and it's very, very, very good. I think the other thing that we need to understand is that um, hard things are part of this life.